couple of very busy weeks for you, right? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I see. So yeah, so let's just jump right in. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Wuhan coronavirus outbreak. Uh, I wanted to start with an episode of an interview you did a couple of weeks ago on the high wire uh, with Dell Big Tree, uh, in which you gave uh, you used science and facts to make a strong case that the coronavirus was lab created, not a naturally occurring organic permutation of a prior virus. But uh, your your stance and position seems to have changed a little bit after that. Can mm -hmm. you just explain, you know, what new facts have you learned? Uh, what has changed since then? Sure. So the public needs to understand the difference between laboratory origin and man-made, right? So it, <clears throat> the question of where this virus came from was supposed to be answerable by looking at the sequences, the genetic sequences. And in the original publication, there was a missing, uh, there was a, a segment of the um, genome that, that the uh, original authors couldn't seem to place. They didn't know where it came from. And <clears throat> a second peer reviewed publication also could not find a match to any known sequences. And this was strange. Um, <clears throat> so they, they called it the middle fragment. So my analysis of the middle fragment uh, was a careful analysis and it led to the discovery that this middle fragment matched what was called P-Shuttle SN. P-Shuttle SN is a vector technology, it turns out, that was derived from a P-Shuttle uh, vector that was created in 1998. The P-Shuttle SN was the only match that I could find this to, along with some spike proteins but it, it was 67% or so similar. So given all the data that we had at the time, it seemed like we had found something of a match between a vector technology and the, um, the novel coronavirus mis, you know, fragment. It's, it would seem to almost as if there was a leftover piece of the vector technology. So <clears throat> uh, moving forward then, as science does, the question is, how do we test this hypothesis? And the way you test a hypothesis is to try to um, you de de design a critical test that if the critical test fails, then it, we can falsify the hypothesis and say that we have, have not corroborated the hypothesis. So, so to take this approach to science, then I had to think about the best way that we could really truly critically test this. And phylogenetics is a, is, a, is a useful tool that I can make the prediction, if given all the coronavirus spike proteins that we have data for in the database, if P-Shuttle is most closely related to the SARS-CoV-19 coronavirus, then we can say, yes, there seems to be a strong link. <clears throat> Or if this P-Shuttle SN clusters with other kinds of coronaviruses more strongly, then that would tell us, well, this is probably not related. And so I undertook that analysis, and I found that the P-Shuttle SN actually clustered with the SARS coronavirus cluster that was related to a genomics project, I think at Guangdong, as well as a cancer center project, and it did. It seems as though it was uh, either used there or it was uh, derived from them. And so we can rule out that P Shuttle SN was involved in the development of SARS CoV 19. Mm. But it doesn't rule out other vectors as potentially being used. And so I made sure to include all the other artificial spike proteins. Uh, that, that, that I had the data for, and none of them clustered with SARS-CoV-19, which means that none of the data that we have right now supports a vector origin of the virus. I and see. Being, okay. Sure, go ahead, go ahead, please. Now, something happened, <clears throat> something happened along the way that I think is a very lucky set of circumstances because this analysis exonerates any of the published sequences uh, uh, as being a source that, that were in the lab. 
It doesn't mean that it didn't come from an accidental laboratory release of a natural virus. It did, doesn't mean that it did. What it means is that we, we can say that there doesn't seem to be a fingerprint of mankind on this virus at this time. Um, then we undertook a further analysis to see, okay, is there a characteristic signature in the functional motifs of the protein, the spike protein, in um, SARS coronavirus 19? And if there is a difference in the functional motif patterns in SARS coronavirus 19, are there any other sequences in the databases that we have that have that functional motif pattern? And that functional motif pattern may well be a signature of pathogenicity. And so having noticed that the SARS-CoV-19 motif pattern at the protein analysis level was different than SARS, it gave us what could be a signature of pathogenicity. And so we downloaded all of the protein sequences for a spike protein to try to see if in fact there was any kind of a match. Now this work is under peer review and I have permission from the journal that's reviewing it to publish the paper. I've, I've, I've put the paper, I've submitted the paper to an archive to see if they'll publish it mm -hmm. uh, ahead of peer review. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, what we found was really exciting because some Chinese scientists way back in 2005 actually published a study of, of three sequences from coronavirus. And scientists in, at North Carolina University in the United States downloaded those sequences along with a fourth sequence. And they recreated it by a process called um, consensus. They calculated the consensus sequence of the viral genome from these four sequences to recreate the a virus in the lab or to create a, a virus in the in the lab um, so they could study its biological properties and its properties of pathogenicity what they didn't know and what i found what ipac research found was that one of the sequences published by the chinese team had a pathogenicity signature that matches ncov sars ncov 19 no one knew this until I undertook the analysis. And the world will know about it when we publish the results in peer review. But this is an important finding because that means that the SARS-CoV-19 is not a recently developed virus by any means. It's been around since 2005 at least. They probably sampled an animal in the lab that had it. It's probably a rarer type of SARS than, than regular SARS. And when they sampled the animals in the wild, to get this, and they, these are wild-caught animals. They didn't know that they had the SARS-CoV-19 back in 2005. So <coughs> this rules out a recent laboratory origin. You know, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold. No um, the it, it rules out a bioweapon, in my view, mm -hmm. that this is just another... Um, uh, virus that we happen to have in the lab and we're studying it. Now, I can tell that the North Carolinians didn't know in the United States that they had uh, two types of viruses, not one, because they never would have calculated the consensus of the two types of viruses if they understood that the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-19 sequence that they had uh, was substantially functionally different. That they they would have you know, right and laboratories around the world need to need to look at the at the viruses that they're studying. Some of them may be studying SARS, but all this time they may have they think that they're studying SARS, but all this time they may have been start, uh, um, studying SARS-CoV-19. It's a very very important motif signature. It's very very distinct. It's it's unmistakable. And the interesting thing is that the motif signature is robust to changes in the genetic sequence. It's robust to changes in the protein sequence itself. The amino acids can change and you can still have the same motif. So it's indicative of function. So there seems to be a major functional difference between SARS-CoV 2019 and the spike protein, um, which would go along with uh, its higher amount of infectivity. But it also raises some other questions. 
like, you know, what's the expected rate of severe illness outside of China? What's the expected rate of severe, you know, illness leading to death outside of China? And why does it appear to be so much lower? Now, we don't have enough time yet to say for sure what the expected mortality rate or the expected serious illness rate is. But if the expected serious illness rate in the rest of the world, as this spreads throughout the world, is as high as it is in China, it means 60, something like 60% of the Earth could become, of the Earth's inhabitants of, of humanity could become seriously ill. Mm. And that's overwhelming. Right. And so... There's a possibility, the, the current hypothesis that I'm working on is that prior exposure to the spike protein through infection or through vaccination may sensitize people to have a hyper reaction to the SARS-CoV-19 infection. Mm. And it may be that people in the Hubei province have been for many years, the older people especially, have had more of a chance to pick up a slight infection of uh, SARS coronavirus with a spike protein, or perhaps through exposure of a uh, you know, cut in their skin if they're handling meats or if they're eating meats that have it, they might get a small dose of it, and they might have you know prior exposure from natural sources, ambient exposure it's called. But it's also possible that there is a vaccination program that we don't know about, phase two or phase three. And this is speculative, but we know that the Chinese ran, <clears throat> the Chinese scientists ran a phase one um, vaccination program back in 2007, I think it was, and they had at least 120 people um, for the SARS coronavirus. And the reason why I suspect that is because the animal studies show that when you take a a vaccine, when you use a vaccine, you test a vaccine that has a spike protein in it from SARS against the animal, uh, you test it in animals, right? Rats or mice. Um, the, the, you, you inject them first with the vaccine and then you wait a while and then you challenge them with the actual virus. And the rates of mortality and serious illness in the vaccine studies in animals matches that which we're seeing right now with the natural challenge from SARS-CoV-19. So <clears throat> there, there's a number of possible explanations here. The um, It's possible that in the animal studies that the wild type vac you know, virus that they thought that they were challenging was SARS-CoV-19. Now we know that that, that could have been, that could have explained this. There's mm -hmm. a lot that we have to, to, to figure out, but um, I'm concerned obviously for you know, the 70,000 or more than 70,000 people in China who are, are undergoing human pain and suffering, they're undergoing economic suffering, it's scary, you know, there's over 1,700 deaths now, each one of those deaths is a, a beloved, mourned person, um, and, and I'm a little bit concerned that, you know, international relationships, mm -hmm. And international positions on policy may be colored by this discussion. There's there's discussions about was it a bioweapon? Was it lab released? Was it, you know, and I contributed to that certainly by pointing to Pea Shuttle. But I, I think what we need to do is ask the governments to get together, the representatives, and include scientists in the discussions to outline what the legitimate concerns are at this point. And it may surprise you to, to learn that my position is that the origin of this is not of high priority anymore. The origin mm -hmm. only tells us, okay, it came from this lab or it came from this animal. We may never know what the ultimate origin of this. We may never be able to detect it. If the materials aren't present in laboratories as they get sequenced and they should be all be sequenced, if we can't find a, a, an animal that has 99.999% similarity across the genome, you know, very similar, we may never know. But the, the legitimate concerns at this point is reducing the rate of spread of SARS-CoV-19. SARS-CoV-19 needs to be, the rate of spread needs to be shut down by informing people now to start mild social isolation. Don't shake hands in public and don't kiss and don't hug. Use what we call the Ebola fist bump of touching elbows to say hello. But more importantly than that, we need everybody to 
um, the government should be telling, all the public health agencies should be telling all businesses, all public places, to have a staff member that goes around every hour wiping down um, very, very frequently touched common surfaces like door handles and light fixtures and bathroom fixtures, menus in restaurants and keypads in grocery stores, all of these specific spots that millions of people touch, tens of thousands of people touch in any location, depending on location. Public transit should have people that wipe down the seats and the, and the, and the handlebars with bleach containing solution. Not in a big way. You don't have to fog the whole bus. You just wipe it down so that the rate of transmission is, is, is shut down. I'm talking about everywhere in the world. Right, right. Okay. And and if the public health authorities don't do this, and the public should, you know, some simply start doing it themselves. Businesses should say that, you know, we're a clean facility. They're a clean facility. And, and it, how nice it would be to see, you know, people carrying virucidal wipes into restaurants and wiping down the menus themselves and wiping down the condiment containers themselves. You're doing a public surface. And also, you're you're preventing the spread in your own community, so it's for, it's it's to your own benefit. It should become very uh, impolite to use a publicly shared public surface without cleaning it after you're done with it, like it is in the gym. If you go to the gym and you work out, people that go to the gym should wipe down. They should put a, a slight amount of bleach in the containers of the cleaner, so that they, we have a better chance of of wiping you know, wiping away and wiping down the viruses. And killing the viruses. So it's very important that people understand that 60% of humanity could become seriously ill if we don't shut down the rate of spread of COVID-19. I see, I see. So yeah, so you mentioned sort of uh, the role of uh, media and also public opinion on this, but I sort of wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the after effects of your interview then. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how closely you follow the Chinese social media, uh, domestic and also international, but you know, if you take the, the <laughs> reaction, the reaction on Chinese media and also Chinese social media is probably one or two order, order of magnitude larger than the English speaking world. You know, your interview segment has been dissected, has been put on you know, Chinese sub, uh, subtitles, has been passionately assessed by, you know, scientists and, you know, conspiracy theorists alike. Did you did you expect that media attention? Well, first of all, I'm glad that it's gotten that kind of attention because science is for asking questions and it's get it's got a lot of people looking very closely at the hypotheses that I outlined. I honestly didn't expect it to be a huge controversy because I had outlined four different hypotheses, not just exactly. one. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And then the four different hypotheses, um, I was asked, which of these do you think is most likely? And if I, and other people, other scientists contacted me after the interview and they said, given the information that you had at hand, yes, I can see that that was, uh, you know, why you would come to that. You didn't have the, I didn't have the pangolin sequence at the time, right? The, the, the SARS uh, genome, the, the SARS-CoV 2019 pangolin sequence at the time. I hadn't done the, nobody knew about the motif structure. So, you know, the good, the good news is that I stated it as a hypothesis. It was clearly stated as a hypothesis. And, yeah. and I've outlined that the, 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 what hypotheses are for is for testing. Right. So you make a, a bold assertion that maybe this is correct or maybe it's not. You make a, a hypothesis. And and the more bold the hypothesis, right? If I had done, I didn't know the outcome of the analysis. I stated my hypothesis first and then I went about testing it. And if the Peace Shuttle did cluster right next to SARS-CoV-19, we'd be having a very different conversation. Right. Now, there's scientists in the world who knew that it wouldn't, but these are experts in the area, and they full well knew what, what P-Shuttle SN was. But remember that the only reason why I found it was because I searched the sequence against non-viral sequences, something no one else had done, and I noticed the P-Shuttle. And the high wire with Del Bigtree did a fantastic job making clear this is, he said theory, he meant hypothesis. It's, it's not my theory or my hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. It's an hypothesis. Nobody owns them. And it really doesn't matter if it came from me or someone else. It's either going to be testable or it's not testable. If it's testable, it belongs in the realm of science. If it's not testable, 
it doesn't belong in the realm of science. If it's testable, then we should test it. And once we test it, it's either falsified or it's not. This gives us a really great opportunity for all of the public, including the conspiracy theorists, to start thinking about how to use logic and reason and science. Science is for asking questions first and foremost. So I asked a question. Science is for testing hypotheses and helping us understand the origins of disease, helping us understand how to formulate science-based public health policies, and to identify what the most legitimate path forward is in terms of translating that knowledge into reduction of human pain and suffering. That's what IPAC is all about. And so I'm, I shamelessly am very glad that it's getting the kind of press that it is. However, I would ask everyone who has shared it and promoted it or interpreted it or wrote, written their own blog articles about it to please refer back to the blog article where I outlined very clearly that we have new data, as a good scientist would, to test the hypothesis that I stated. It's very simple. And, you know, we want the, we, the media wants the headlines, the conspiracy uh, um, community, of which Highwire is not. Highwire is a legitimate new media press uh, agency, a, 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 a press outlet. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are very cautious to try to make sure that they don't, you know, say things that are that are incorrect. They want everything, you know, double and triple sourced. And, you know, Dell asked me in the second interview, Dell Bigtree asked me in the second interview, what do you say to people who say, well, you know, James, you were wrong and you misled a lot of people and you got a lot of people scared and that kind of thing. And I say, well, you know, how are we supposed, basically, I said, how are we supposed to learn in science unless we could risk being wrong from time to time, right? We, and, and when we find out that we were wrong, and science is not about being wrong, science is about positioning yourself and uh, putting yourself in a position where you have a maximum probability of learning something. And so what we have learned by posing the hypothesis and other scientists reaching out to me and sharing additional information that I needed and some of them challenging me, the ones who supported me and agreed with me, they supported me, but the ones who challenged me also supported me. It, that, that's, it, it, there, there's no controversy in science if you actually execute science objectively. Yes. So I um, also wanted to go back a little bit, as you just sort of mentioned this distinction between, you know, uh, things that belong to the realm of science and things that are outside of the realm of science. So I guess another, uh, you know, curiosity, you know, about all this is that whether the source of this virus is lab versus a natural source, does that belong to the realm of science? Or would you say it's, you know, it's speculative, it's something that people might be interested in, but there's really no way to test that? It's potentially test testable. The way that it's potentially testable is if all the laboratory t samples that exist in China and mm -hmm. around the world, I would say, um, are sequenced. And if we find a much higher sequence similarity to a virus in a, say, a tissue lineage, where they're bringing forward the virus in human tissue, or a tissue lineage where they're bringing forward the virus, propagating it in the mouse tissue. Uh, there could be frozen samples of the virus um, that could be sequenced. There's so more data coming forward. You know, if we can get data that show that it's a match. The problem is if we don't find a match, then we, 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 we could go on and on and on and say, well, it still could be from the lab. It's, you know, and so I think it's, it's a really important question that you ask. We, it's potentially falsifiable, and this is really important because when Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, said, you know, the demarcation between what science is and what science isn't is that you make a hypothesis that is potentially falsifiable and you create a critical test that's actually capable of, of testing the hypothesis. Well, this hypothesis is that it's lab origin or of origin in nature or even still, there's still some scientists who think it could be a recombination through an intermediate host, even though the first people that put that out, um, the Chinese, the rest of the world said, no, that's not, a, that's not, that's not likely. Um, it is potentially testable if we a positive match is made where it's undeniably more similar than the pangolin sequence or the bat sequence, right? Then we can say, okay, this is this is of a lab 
origin. That doesn't mean it's man-made. I've got to stress that every time I say it, right? But mm -hmm. if we don't find it, then the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right. If we, right, we, we should never base any public health policy on the absence of evidence, right? right. right? And, and unless you're absolutely sure right, that you have found yet another animal, right, a pot, we need positive data to make a match. So unfortunately, we're in a situation where it's potentially falsifiable, but the problem is, can we define a truly critical test? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if we're going to, you know, so let's sequence all of the sequences in the lab and see if it turns out to have been a critical test. Let's look at all of the data, any data that exists right now that people haven't published. Um, and, and if we can do, if we can look at all of the data and find this, you know, uh, functional motif signature, uh, that's interesting. But if we find a 99.999% similar match, right, in a lab housed virus, even if it's from a natural origin, then we have to say, okay, where did it, you know, who, who most likely was infected? Was it something that was discarded by the lab and, and picked up? Was it an escaped animal? Who knows what the scenarios might be? Other people might be better at assessing the probabilities of those different scenarios. That's in the realm of speculation, but it, it, speculation is part of hypothesis building. And so until we define a test, you know, there's a continuum between speculation and guessing and, and formulating a testable hypothesis. And I think we sit right now at a place where the most important question, the most legitimate concern is, 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 is how do we shut down R0 from this coronavirus, as I said. The origin is a legitimate concern only to the extent that there may be some data that might be useful in terms of shutting down the progression of, of, of the continuation of the pandemic uh, that's unpublished. So if somebody in a lab has some data about this virus and they didn't know it was this virus until they sequenced it, let's say, they might have an antiviral that's working that's very specific to this and much better than SARS. You see, this is the way science works. If I think I'm studying SARS and I'm actually studying SARS coronavirus 19 and I don't know it, like the people back in 25, 2005 and people back in 2018 or 2008, sorry, there may be some data that's very relevant to the treatment of this or relevant for other, you know, therapeutics. Convalescent <clears throat> therapy doesn't require us to know the legitimate, you know, the, 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 the origin of this. Mm -hmm. Convalescent therapy only needs to know that a person has antibodies to this. We can get the antibodies from it. And I think convalescent therapy should be looked at. You know, people who want to try to develop a vaccine for, for this, unfortunately, we're faced with the animal data that says that when you vaccinate, you, you and then you challenge with the wild type, you have high mor mortality and morbidity. Now, there's different kinds of vaccines. There's an mRNA type vaccine that's very virus like, where, where you basically are programming the cell to make uh, proteins that are similar to the spike proteins, but they're not a full virus. That's an interesting uh, possibility. But we, re we need to know the type of virus that we're studying. And I've already shown, and I hope that when the publication comes out, the world will know that they're, 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 we knew about this virus a long time ago. So there, there's that we've had research on this virus potentially from 2005. That's a long time. It's, 20, it's 2020. For 15 years, we've had the virus in labs. So there may, in fact, be some very interesting data. So we need to sequence everything that's ever been studied about SARS and find out who's actually got any useful data. That's very important. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. So yeah. So um, I really appreciate your honesty and you know, uh, your you know your clarification on you know what your current stance is, especially you know you sort of distinguish between hypothesis and theory. And now you know the the lab source is only a hypothesis. It might not even be a hypothesis yet. But we want to be super clear that you are not saying that this virus comes from a lab. It's only one possibility that needs to be studied um, potentially. Well, right. Well, I, I would correct on the use of theory, too, because a theory is a hypothesis that's been, you know, replicated and validated, uh, you know, multiple times. Right. So um, in biology, it's, it's biology has been very messy with their use of the terminology. Hypotheses and theories are very well understood in terms of uh, physics. OK. Yeah. And, and it's it's it, it, what we what we have is a hypothesis is the original statement and then it's tested and it's either 
falsified or it's not, and then going fur further, if other people can replicate it, <coughs> excuse me, then it can become a theory. But a theory in biology usually is some kind of a complex explanation okay. for some process. Here we're just trying to find out. We're categorizing what we have. Okay. And yes, this outbreak is a serious threat to human health and human pain and suffering around the world. So all of the laboratories should try to determine the genetic sequence of any SARS that they think that they have that is SARS, because it may actually be SARS-CoV-19. They may not know it. I found that out through the motif thing. Um, I, I would be more than happy um, to share with you the link as soon as the archive comes out um, so, that, so that you can spread the word. But um, if, if, they, if they accept it, there, there's some question about whether or not they're going to think that it's suitable for their archive. And I'm surprised to, to know that, but that's the truth. Um, I see. But I, I will certainly let you know, Lizzie, as, as soon as I, as I can. And, and, you know, I'm very grateful for um, you know the people's concern over the realities that, that of, of where we stand and what we know in mm -hmm. terms of the science of coronavirus 19 and the public's interest and the public's the public's attention is very very uh, valuable at this time um, if, towards uh, informing them on, on what to do how to behave but it's more important right now I think that they turn to their governments and they ask their governments to help identify, the most legitimate concerns and that, that the, the governments of the world work together. It's time for everybody to come together on what the most legitimate concerns are. And I don't hear enough about prior social isolation. I hear the CDC saying, well, we're going to try quarantining these people. And mm -hmm. if that doesn't work, then we're going to go to social isolation. I and mean, why wait? Why in the world would you wait three or four or five weeks to see if quarantining was enough? When there, we know that, you know, December first is the benchmark of the maybe the first case in this, in 2019, and that until the world became aware of it, put travel restrictions on, you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people were traveling around the the globe, potentially c carrying SARS coronavirus back home with them, or potentially carrying it abroad with them, and. The, you know, why wait for social isolation? These public health agencies need to get the word out right now that we need to sanitize our, we need to all work together to sanitize our, our shared environment um, before the outbreak makes it to your town, before we know that it's there. It's very important. <laughs> I see, I see. No, well, thank you so much for all the information. It's been super helpful, and we do hope that we contain this virus as soon as possible, and we do hope that public health officials in the United States and also outside the United States can sort of, you know, get their acts together and sort of, you know, tackle this challenge head on. But thank you so much. Thank you. It's been You're great welcome, Lizzie. You.